Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now in today's one I'll be putting together a low cost gaming PC for a family member who wanted something that could handle Minecraft and other lightweight titles. Most of the parts I've used have probably appeared on the channel before, but combining them will create something that more than meets the brief. For the CPU we have the 8th Gen 6 core i5-8500, the performance difference of which is minimal over the 8400 but then again so is the price difference these days. This is clocked at 3GHz out of the box and has an all core turbo of 3.9, it's based on the 1151 platform. I'll be pairing this with 16 gigs of 3000MHz Corsair Vengeance DDR4, 8 gigs is probably fine if you're on a really tight budget but 16 just gives us a little more headroom even if this machine isn't going to be playing the latest demanding AAA titles. For the motherboard we have the Gigabyte Z370 HD3 which I pulled out of a used pre-built machine not too long ago. This is an ATX board that I really like the look of and it's got more than enough features and ports for our usage. Storage wise I've gone with a brand new Crucial P3 NVMe SSD, a cheap and cheerful drive that will offer more than enough space. I tend to go for a minimum of 1TB for any build these days no matter who it's for or what it's for as it's better to have more storage than necessary than running out of storage unexpectedly. We'll talk about the graphics card later, but first let's put this together inside the CIT Pyro case. I've not used one of these before, but it was one of the lowest cost cases I could find that had a tempered glass side panel and support for our ATX motherboard. I don't have a cost summary for this entire build as some of the parts I've owned for a while and some I've got from other secondhand pre-builds that I've taken apart. As I put some build footage up on screen then let me talk to you a little more about this configuration. I went with a mix of new and used components as the budget for this one was quite small. Between you and me I won't be making any money from this build but that's not a priority here. The i5-8500 I'm using is pretty much the same as the i5-8400 albeit with slightly higher clocks. That said at the time of this video it costs the same at CEX as the 8400 so I thought I may as well go for this one. By default the CPU supports up to 2666 MHz memory but with this board and XMP enabled we can make full use of the 3000 MHz speed. I'm not sure how much of a difference that will actually make with my configuration but because I already owned the faster DDR4 I thought we may as well set it to run at its full potential. All that's left to do with our board before putting it in the case is slot the SSD into place. My favourite thing about M.2 SSDs aside from the speed is the lack of requirements for a SATA cable or SATA power connector. It seems trivial but it actually makes PC building that little bit more simple and tidier as well. Time to get our combo inside the case. The CIT Pyro here comes with a pre-installed rear fan which is always a nice inclusion especially when trying to save a little bit of money. The motherboard standoffs were screwed in too and in the right places so we didn't have to do that. At this stage I'd like to remind you to install your motherboard standoffs if they aren't in place already as well as the IO shield which I have definitely been known to forget in the past. After that we'll get our motherboard in and screw it down. This is always my favourite part as it feels like the main event. Once this is in, it's just our GPU and cabling to worry about. Oh and the power supply. I usually install this first so I don't know why I left it until now but there we go. This is mounted at the bottom and around the back of our CIT case. I'm using a 600 watt EVGA unit that I've used before but I know it's reliable, fairly quiet and it will be more than enough for our system. It also has a couple of PCIe connectors for any future upgrades. This is the last time you'll be seeing this one on the channel. It's off to its new home now. With this screwed in, all that's left is the cables and the graphics card. I connected the 24 pin power cable and the 8 pin CPU power cable first before hooking up all the cables that run from the case including USB 3, USB 2 audio and the always fiddly front panel connectors which include power, power LEDs and HDD LEDs. We also need to hook up a SATA cable from the PSU to a connector at the front of the case for the lights 
lights as well as a Molex PSU cable which I believe is for that rear fan. When it comes to cable management I don't like to tie everything up tight in case I need to access any connectors in the future but I did sort of hide things away and there's plenty of room to do so. With all this done the last step was to install our GPU which in this case is the trusty GTX 1050 Ti. This 4GB card was once a fantastic go to choice for gamers on a budget but it's still more than enough for Minecraft and other lightweight games. It'll handle certain FPS titles really well too like Fortnite and Apex Legends. Perfect if you want a low cost machine for those sorts of games. It'll also be ideal for more casual computing and gaming too. This pallet version of the card doesn't require any external power and it won't take up much room inside our case. The CPU could definitely handle more for sure and we have those spare PCIe connectors just in case of future upgrades. This should be more than enough for the intended purposes though so let's turn the machine on and see how it does. Nice to see everything working here and we even have a selection of lighting effects to choose from with the case. We can turn this off completely as well for those of you wondering. Now I'll be installing Windows 10 on this one as per request but the i5-8500 also meets the requirements for Windows 11. So let's get into some games. First off let's test the game that this PC was built for. It's a little bit overkill to be honest for Minecraft but here with the default fabulous settings at 1080p resolution we have an average frame rate of 306 frames per second. I'm not actually convinced that who this PC is going to is going to be using a 1080p monitor. It might be an even lower resolution so we might be able to get some higher frames from all of today's tested games as well. So. It's nice to have more power than we need rather than not enough, in my opinion. This was the Java edition of the game. I then tested some other games just to see how well they would do, namely eSports titles for the most part. Counter-Strike 2 is at first at 1080p with the lowest settings for an average of 158 FPS. The 1% low was 84 and the 0.1% low was 43, so a couple of little dips and drops here and there, but nothing off-putting. In Apex Legends at 1080p I went with the high textures, everything else was set to lowest and TSAA was enabled as our form of anti-aliasing. This meant a 112 FPS average with a 1% low of 70 and a 0.1% low of 55. Another solid result for the i5 and 1050Ti combo. In Fortnite we have 100% resolution scale along with the low preset and FXAA for an average of 160 FPS. The 1% low was also respectable but there were a few dips and drops here as I usually expect from Fortnite. We do have a performance mode that we can enable as well but I thought that this was absolutely fine as it was and we could certainly turn a few things up if we wanted to stick closer to but still exceed 60 frames per second. GTA 5 is up next, a very popular game still years after its release. We have the detail sliders halfway, the high settings and the shadows set to soft. FXAA was also enabled for an average of 121 FPS. The percentile lows were also very good and the game held up quite consistently even in and around those busier areas. Finally then we have Warzone, the game I felt would present most of a challenge to this hardware. At 1080p with FSR 2.1 and the minimum preset, with SMAA T2X set to low we saw 79 FPS. Our 1% low was 51 and our 0.1% low was 31, so really not bad overall. As I said before, this machine isn't probably going to be used for games like this, but it's nice to see that it can handle more intensive titles should the need arise. These components aren't necessarily what I'd choose if I was building a PC from scratch at a limited price point but I feel that they do work well together and they are ideal for casual gaming and some of those esports games as well. That's all for this one then, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you did leave a like, leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.